All right, all right. Red Nation, today we're going to be talking about metal artifacts. What are the root causes of metal artifacts in CT? And how can they be reduced with fancy CT reconstruction? Coming up here at How Radiology Works. So first off, metal artifacts, right? Imagine we're taking an image of the patient's pelvis, let's say. Here's a nice visual of the pelvis. You have a couple of hip bones here within the pelvis. And you have a bunch of soft tissue in the pelvis as well. And then traditionally in CT, what we're doing is we have an x-ray source and we have an x-ray detector. And then we have x-rays that are passing from our source to our detector. And we're measuring the transmission of those x-rays as they come through. The x-rays which are passing through these two bones, they're going to have significantly more interactions and more of the x-rays are going to get stopped in these bones than the x-rays that are going just to the soft tissue themselves. These x-rays that are passing through mostly soft tissue are mostly going to pass through and get measured on the detector. So this is how traditional CT works. And then what happens if you have metal in the patient? So for instance, if this patient had a hip implant in just one of the hips, what are the reasons for metal artifacts? What's going to change in this acquisition between with and without the metal? Beam hardening, we've got a separate video on beam hardening. Check that one out if you haven't seen it already. So the spectra actually is going to go from this solid line to this dotted line. And that is a harder beam. So even though there's less x-rays under that harder beam, the average energy of the x-rays is actually higher. So that causes what we call beam hardening artifact. That's particularly obvious when you have relatively light metals where that type of interaction can actually be a dominant cause if you have a lighter metal. Number two is scatter. So scatter, the idea is you can have x-rays that are coming off and then they interact via content scatter in the patient and then they get measured in a region which is not a straight line connecting the x-ray tube and detector as we expect, but rather it's something like this. And we don't have a way of actually measuring that. And so when you have fewer primary x-rays, because a lot of them have been attenuated by a highly attenuating object such as metal, then scatter can actually interact and cause a significant contribution. Number three is what we call partial volume artifacts. The idea here is we're actually dealing with a nonlinear process in Beer's Law. And we do a logarithm of the data in order to make it linear. But in the case where there's this significant amount of attenuation here and it's changing rapidly, that can cause what we call partial volume artifacts. And then number four, and the one that really is the dominant behavior and most of the time when you're used to talking about metal artifacts, is actually the case of photon starvation. So we use photon starvation to talk about the fact that basically barely any photons are making it through. So you could have orders of magnitude, fewer photons being measured on the detector. When we try and do the actual reconstruction, we're in an area of what we call photon starvation, where our statistics of the x-rays getting measured beyond that metal are very poor in comparison with the statistics that we're measuring on the rest of the detector. This is what we call photon starvation and is typically the biggest cause in these really significant metal artifact cases. If you have a single metallic object, which is very highly attenuating, what you're generally going to see is artifacts that are originating from the area of this metallic object and will come off in streaks around this metallic object. That's due to these, these different causes here and especially due to photon starvation. This is made even worse in the case that you have multiple highly attenuating metallic objects. So if you have just one object, then you still have relatively good measurements of all the different view angles in your projection space, as long as you're away from the metallic object a little bit. So you'll get some streaks coming off and they'll start to correct things around that metallic object and make streaks around it. But if you have multiple objects, such as a bilateral hip, in the case of the bilateral hip, 
Now from both directions, if whether our x-rays on this side or whether our x-rays on this side, we're basically never going to get good measurements of x-ray path lengths that go along this direction. So we're going to get actually significant artifacts, which actually in the image end up connecting these two regions. So in the image, you'll actually typically get really strong artifacts that are connecting the two regions. Then we want to talk about metal artifact reduction techniques. So these are typically referred to as MAR in the literature. So if you use iterative reconstruction, you can actually model the path lengths going through these different objects, and that can actually improve the reconstruction capability. Additionally, ways that you can use kind of built-in software is using higher energy acquisition. So if you use a higher KVP, you're more likely to get your x-rays through metallic op. And if you have a dual energy acquisition, you can look at the higher KEV images, which are virtual monochromatic images. They're also designed to have the characteristics of higher energy images. So again, they'll be making images corresponding to those x-rays that are more likely to get through these metallic objects. But if those ways don't work, if you have significant metal art, then you might be in the case where you need a dedicated metal artifact production algorithm. And the idea here is we have both our image space on this side, and then we have our projection space on this side. This we also call the sinogram because these given points in the image space, they will in general trace out a sinusoid in the sinogram here. And the metal artifact reduction techniques, at the heart of it, what they're trying to do is actually, first off, pretend like we want to make an image where the metal doesn't exist. So in the very first techniques, what we did was we took this sinogram and you can see in the sinogram, there's these really highly attenuating areas right here. Those actually correspond to the metal. So if you take those really highly attenuating areas and you say, I want to actually make another sinogram, a virtual sinogram, and I will do what we call interpolate or make a best guess based on the neighboring measurements in the projection space, I will make a best guess of what the image would look like imagining we don't have any metal there. Then we can get an image that's actually not corrupted in theory, that's not corrupted by those significant metal artifacts. So that was the first idea, and it worked reasonably well. And then not that long after that, the idea came out, if we could do it in the projection space by estimating where the metal is in the projection space, could we actually do a better job if we estimated where the metal was in the image space? The image is actually going to be a preferred way to estimate where the metal is. So you can actually make what we call a metal mask is you take your image and then you can do some image processing. The simplest one being a threshold to figure out where the metal is in the image. And then you can forward project that metal mask onto the detector and you can figure out where the metal is in the image. So for any given view, you, once you know where the metal is in the image, then you actually map that. This detector space then maps to the sinogram, and then we can do that interpolation process, but we'll be able to do it a little bit better now that we have a more accurate assessment of where the metal is within the image. Then after that, it was actually a little while before there was significant improvements in metal artifacts. And the biggest one as of late came out of the group of Mark Cahorys, and it was actually called Normalized Metal Artifact Reduction, or NMAR for short. So in Normalized Metal Artifact Reduction, the idea is act to have this additional normalization function such that we can think of essentially the whole body outside of the metal in the soft tissue, we can treat that as a similar value, such as the value of water. And then we can actually do a normalization function such that we will map our data from this sinogram 
to a normalized sinogram so that there will be less fluctuation in that normalized sinogram. Then we will use our metal mask in the sinogram to actually do the interpolation in the sinogram again along those regions where there's metal. And after we do our interpolation, we will have a filled in sinogram here. We will then invert that normalization. So the same operations that we did to go from here to here. Then after we've undone that normalization process, we now have our sinogram and we can actually do the reconstruction and we will reconstruct an image again in all these cases. We're actually trying to reconstruct an image without the metal in the image. So typically what is done is we identify the metal in the metal mask and then we say we're going to save those values and we're going to plug them back in after we're all done. So we first reconstruct the image assuming that we put no metal in that image. And then after we're done, we'll make our image without the metal. And then we'll paste that metal back in when we're all done from the values that we got from the metal mask of the initial image. Just in general, each of the vendors has different implementation of their metal artifact reduction algorithms. And the vendors typically don't talk about the specific details that are in each given algorithm. But over time, these actual iterative algorithms where you're doing this processing more than once have shown to have some success. The idea of going from multiple spaces, such as this normalized space, actually shows to have significant ability to reduce other artifacts that the metal artifact reduction process can actually cause. So the vendors have different names for their metal artifact reduction, such as orthopedic mar or omar for one of the vendors and imar for iterative mar for another vendor and at ge we do everything smart so we call our smart mar in general these techniques offer significant improvement for many different types of metal artifacts for most of these techniques you actually still typically want to consult both the initial image without a metal artifact reduction as well as the image with the metal artifact reduction. There's significant ability to improve the visualization of structures that are obscured by these metal artifacts. But in general, these techniques are not perfect. And it is in general recommended to review both the initial image before the metal artifact reduction, as well as the image after the metal artifact reduction. We covered the root causes and how to correct metal with metal artifact reduction. Next, check out our video on beam hardening so you really understand the concepts behind beam hardening that can affect the metal artifacts as well.